uh, of course, radio astronomy has changed a lot. If you have never visited, does everybody know this is the big dish in Arecibo? It's a thousand feet across. And uh, oh, since it was mentioned that I was at NSF, one of my grand experiences was being out on this platform with the director of Arecibo to talk about his budget. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, he had a real advantage out there. <laughs> extremely stable. I mean, some other radio astronomers are correct me, but I think even in a, a strong wind, it moves at most a millimeter. So it's very, very stable. But this is uh, about, I don't know, 800 feet? Is that it, You're way up there. And, uh, you know, there he is talking about the budget and. Oh yeah, the tram's not working today. We're gonna have to walk on this catwalk. <laughs> oh, I know he's got those slippery Washington shoes on. Um, and then here's what was mentioned earlier: this uh, marvelous project that uh, NRAO uh, helped make happen, uh, at least the U.S. part of it, uh, the Atacama uh, Large Millimeter Array, which will be um, more than 50 dishes. Uh, at 17,000 feet in the Atacama, that, uh, where it never rains, it sometimes snows, and this is a photograph, I think, from last December. And this telescope is just getting going. And when I was at NSF, I had the privilege to fall in love with it and uh, help get it going, I mean, just from the bureaucratic side. And this is something that we can all be proud of. This is Global Science Europe. Um, Europe and uh, the United States and Japan and Taiwan cooperating, making making this instrument that will take us back to uh, see the birth of stars and planets and the first galaxies and uh, uh, oh, we even have telescopes at the South Pole. So this is a 10 meter telescope at the South Pole that my you'll hear about more next time that my colleague John Carl <coughs> uh, and of course there's a couple that everybody knows about. Them. Uh, uh, it's only a hundred inches, but it's above the atmosphere of the Earth. And but we don't just have uh, optical eyes in space. This is the Chandra X-ray Observatory. So that's X-ray eyes in space. I'll be showing you X-ray images. Um, and let's see. This one's named after University of Chicago scientist, and this one's named after University of Chicago scientist. <laughs> and this is the Spitzer Telescope, and. Uh, uh, Lyman Spitzer once went through O'Hare Airport. <laughs> <laughs> so we'll claim him. And of course, everybody, uh, in, everybody's holding their breath in more ways than one to see the James Webb Space Telescope uh, launched in 2018. And it will be 260 inches. And uh, it will be uh, more than a million kilometers, about a million miles away from Earth. Because although uh, being above the Earth's atmosphere is good, the Earth uh, blocks half the sky from the Hubble, and the Earth has an atmosphere that sort of gets in the way. And so this is a really cool place. It's called L2. It's where you want to be if you're an astronomer. Uh, and then bigger telescopes in the future. Uh, my university is involved in a project to build the Giant Magellan Telescope, which has the collecting power of, of about a 40-meter telescope, and then uh, Caltech and other universities are going to build a large segmented telescope that I think there's about a thousand pieces um, uh, to this. So instruments have really improved. Um, let's skip that one. But equally important as the instruments are the sensors. And so if you're a real, uh, you know, it's the sensors. And let me tell you about this. So, you know, we all have our cameras and, you know, mine's bigger than yours and all that. And so in astronomy, the, the, cameras, the cameras now have a billion pixels. And this is probably more important than bigger mirrors because uh, photographic plates only collect at about 1% of the light, and these collect almost 100% of the light. So, and you can manipulate the images, and you can put them on the internet. And uh, so uh, this has been an equally uh, big part of the revolution. Now the idea, so an idea is got it. And so I don't want you to get you know, your head turned by these the plumbing. Um, so uh, the idea is, we'll talk about general relativity. Uh, I can teach it to you in one sentence. Uh, quantum mechanics, what did I call this? The triumph of the reductionist. So um, 
this idea of a Democritus that uh, the machine was simpler. If you opened up the machine and looked at the parts, the parts were simpler. That uh, if you take something complicated apart and look at the pieces, they're simpler. That, that has, has been remarkable as we've marched through atoms, neutrons and protons, <coughs> quarks, and uh, maybe to strings. And so these ideas are extremely important. And then finally, uh, this is the third time this will be mentioned, but it's, it's a really big deal, the connections between the very big, the unexpected connections between the very big and the very small. Um, I thought I would just, as a teaser, before we really get going here, um, compare, because I claim that the last 100 years have been a really big deal. Here's what we knew about the universe uh, around 1900, and here's what we know, uh, you know, I could add a 12 here, it's not too different, but you know, 100 years later. Eight planets. Well, some things don't change. Uh, so we still have eight planets. Uh, uh, one of them, you know, there was a promotion, and then, it, you know, they, uh, what is it called, the booth review, and they, they had the replacement referees, and they decided. That, you know, was, um, uh, the sun was very mysterious. Uh, we didn't know how the sun worked. Uh, Based upon the best physics of the time, the sun should only be about 10 million years old. It's an interesting story. It's just running on, on its residual heat. Um, so now we know we can date the sun to better than this, 4.6 billion years old. It's a sun powered by, it's a nuclear reactor, and we know how it works. Uh, we had one galaxy 100,000 light years across, a few million stars visible with telescopes. Um, uh, what else? The universe was static. Uh, uh, 40, well, I already talked about this. The Yerkes observed the Yerkes telescope, 40 inch refracting optical telescope. Um, we have thousands of planets now. No additional ones in our solar system, but all over the place. Uh, it's an evolving universe. That's a really big deal. Uh, the idea that the universe had a beginning. One galaxy, today we know there are at least 100 billion. And that was Hubble, uh, University of Chicago graduate, by the way. You hear that again. Uh, how big is the universe? So, 100,000 light years across. Uh, now we know it's at least 10 billion light years across. And I'll tell you how big. And and maybe we'll, we'll get to the multiverse eventually. But maybe the universe is even bigger. Uh, and then I, I took you through all through all the instruments. Um, Okay, so so let's uh, let's get warmed up here. So um, I think it's probably fair to say that Hubble was the greatest astronomer of the 20th century. He's the greatest astronomer who was trained at the University of Chicago. <laughs> but, um, what did he do? Why why do we think uh, he's so great? So the big puzzle at the start of well less than 100 years ago, the big puzzle is these little fuzzy patches on the sky that. Messier and others had catalog. What are they? What are they? And Kant, Emmanuel Kant, speculated that they were island universes. Uh, that's a very bold, uh, that's a very extravagant interpretation. Others thought that these fuzzy patches on the sky were just gas clouds within our own galaxy. So that was the raging question that, you know, what are the nebulae? And uh, it was Hubble who resolved this question. And it's an interesting story. Um, did I mention that he got all his degrees at the University of Chicago? <laughs> did I mention that he was the power forward on the uh, basketball team that won the NCAA title three years running? Did I mention that? And he was a very interesting character. He, uh, no one would ever say that he was the greatest observer of all time. He was certainly not a theorist but he had a nose for important problems. And even as a graduate student, he was interested in the nebulae. Uh, he published a completely unremarkable thesis that actually went up to the Hubble uh, telescope during uh, one of its servicings and came back down. It wasn't any better even after it came down. <laughs> and uh, he left the University of Chicago and he was offered, a, a, I don't know, an assistant astronomer at uh, Mount Wilson. But um, World War I was on, and he really wanted to serve his country. And so he postponed 
that fellowship. Uh, and it was the smartest thing he ever did because it took him about three years to go to Europe and come back. And that telescope, like many telescopes, uh, didn't work very well early on. Uh, you know, state-of-the-art instrument. And had he gone there, probably it would have been a very discouraging career. So he went there. That telescope was powerful enough to resolve uh, stars, uh, very bright stars, in the Andromeda galaxy, <coughs> the nearest galaxies. Um, and he was able to measure the distance to Andromeda and show that it was much bigger than the galaxy. And whoosh, all of a sudden, he had uh, enlarged the universe by a factor of 100 billion. And in fact, this was such a sudden development that uh, I believe this is the last time there was cooperation between Princeton University and the University of Chicago. Uh, uh, Henry Norris Russell thought that his achievement was so important that he asked Science Magazine to accept a late entry into their, uh, they have an annual comp uh, competition, I think it's the Newcomb Prize for the most important paper. So it was really important. This, this question had been resolved, and all of a sudden, this is the universe. Uh, galaxies, uh, 100,000 light years across, I'll come back again. That's the distance light travels in 100,000 years, uh, and uh, millions of, of light years in separation. So uh, that was in 1924. So until 1924, we thought there was just one galaxy. Um, and but well, what's fun about science, science is such a great activity. What's fun about science is you always ask the question, OK, what are the nebulae? Um, well, it turns out many of them, uh, in fact, I think probably more than half of them in Messier's catalog, are just things within our own galaxy. But uh, a fair fraction of them are external galaxies. And uh, so uh, both answers were right. And some of the ones within our own galaxies, this is the Crab Nebula. Uh, I see Roger Chevalier in the front, who's the world's expert on the Crab, can tell you anything about the Crab. He was there when the Crab exploded. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, Roger was born in Chicago, Saturday. Big Chicago connections there. Um, and of course, what you all probably know is that Hubble um, is the person who uh, discovered that the universe was expanding. And um, so, uh, and he was on the cover of Time magazine. Uh, uh, he, he was quite a character. And what he discovered is all the other galaxies are moving away from us. And uh, the one, so that's indicated by the arrow. Uh, and, uh, you know, that was even before we were running a large deficit and, you know, <laughs> I'm concerned that, you know, thought we had really big problems. And so um, the ones that are more distant are moving faster, shown by the bigger arrows. And um, so this pattern of motion, we call it the Hubble flow, uh, is uh, the fingerprint of the Big Bang. Um, so if I take away the galaxies, this is uh, this pattern that he saw. And for a moment, I just want you to think about this. So let's suppose you came into a room and uh, you saw pieces of stuff flying away from the center of the room, and the pieces that were farthest from the center of the room were flying faster. After a while, you would figure out that somebody set off a firecracker at the center of the room, and the reason that the pieces farther from the center of the room are moving faster is, well, the ones that move faster you know, move a larger distance in, in that time since the explosion. And so if we run the movie backwards, take this, run the movie backwards, we find that uh, everything was in one place about 14 billion years ago. So, I mean, this is a really big discovery that uh, Hubble made. Um, and let's see, here's his data. Here he is at the telescope. Uh, here's his data. And uh, it looks very uh, uh, simple, a bunch of points. Looks like people spilled a bunch of little coffee spots on the graph. And he was wise enough to draw a straight line through it. And uh, this is distance, this is velocity. Uh, the ones that are farther away are moving faster. And um, what's stunning about this is that there are a couple of things to be said about this. Number one, science isn't just, you know, X did this and Y did that. Uh, the person who measured most of these velocities uh, was uh, 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 an astronomer named Slifer, who got Hubble interested in this. And uh, what was most interesting about this 
was that most stars and other objects whose velocity had been measured were really small. 